Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I'll wait a couple of minutes just to let some more people hop on. But just to start, if anybody has questions, there is a question box below that you can type um, type out your question, and that goes to me directly, and those will be answered during the Q&A portion of the video. All righty. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. You, and you, you can still hear me? Okay, good. Yes. So good morning, everybody. Um, thanks so much for joining us for the third annual Visit Big Sky Marketing Outlook, which has been a luncheon in the past at the Horn and Cantle at Lomon Ranch, but however, is moving to a virtual meeting today in light of our, our current situation, which we'll get into here a little bit more. We have uh, amazing guest speakers with us this morning, both Superintendent Cam Shelley, who needs no introduction of America's first national park, and our very own Chief Operating Officer, of the biggest skiing in America, Big Sky Resort, it's Taylor Middleton. So super excited. We've got some announcements today. I'm sure you're all sitting here on the edge of your seats waiting to hear. Um, but before we get into our speakers, um, I just want to set the stage a little bit and provide um, a State of the Union uh, after just a little introduction of what we're celebrating here today. Because I think in light of everything that's going on, that we do still need to take the opportunity to celebrate some positive things. So. First and foremost, Visit Big Sky is your official destination marketing and management organization is here and I'm trying to drive and talk at the same time um, to lead the development and promotion of authentic tourism experiences, working in partnership with our various stakeholders in Big Sky to grow our economy while at the same time preserving our place, this beautiful place that we all call home. Our four strategic priorities include developing that experience, in particular related to summer, to try to rival that world-class winter reputation that we already have and so much supports a lot that goes on here, to establish ourselves as an organization and the leadership uh, of the Tourism Collective, not only locally, but statewide and nationally. And then lastly, to steward this destination so that those visitors and residents consuming this place is in balance with the needs of the natural place and its wildlife itself. So um, with that, uh, we are celebrating National Travel and Tourism Week. This is an annual program of the US Travel Association that really tries to shine the spotlight on the impact of travel on communities across the nation, as well as the nation as a whole as a global tourism destination. So we've had quite a few events this week. National Travel and Tourism Week kicked off on um, Sunday, May 3rd. Uh, it runs through the 9th, and on Tuesday, the U.S. Travel Association hosted a virtual road trip across all states of the United States. Montana was featured at 6 o'clock Mountain Time. Um, this was done on Twitter, as well as other social media channels, so we were happy to participate in that. In addition, a small group of us, of about 10 to be exact, because we can't gather in groups larger than 10, from around the state drove to Helena and stood on a trailhead overlooking the Capitol and got some tremendous press for the tourism industry and its role uh, in Montana's economy. Um, today, we celebrate our annual Marketing Outlook meeting. And again, I wanna say luncheon, however, a virtual meeting as part of this week to come together as stakeholders in the tourism and visitor economy for Big Sky in the state of Montana. Um, this goes without saying, and I don't really wanna spend a whole lot of time of why we're here uh, having certain conversations today with the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as economic downturn has impacted everyone. And so we're here to talk about what are we doing in response and how we're gonna move forward on that road to recovery as our uh, governor Bullock has re started to reopen Montana in phases. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so on April 22nd, the governor announced this phased reopening. The stay at home directive was lifted on uh, April 26th. On April 27th, certain non-essential businesses as they'd been called in the past were reopened such as retail, hair salons. My staffer just walked in with a fabulous new haircut, for example. Um, and then on May 4th, our restaurants and bars at a, a reduced capacity of 50% we're permitted to open as well. So this is all part of our phase one. Um, Big Sky Resort closed on March 16th. Uh, Yellowstone National Park was closed on March 30th, all in response to COVID-19. And we're operating under those closures at the moment. 
In addition, the 14-day self-quarantine that was imposed by the governor on March 30th continues to be in place and is effective in indefinitely per the governor. And obviously that has a significant uh, impact on us because that relates to any person from outside of Montana traveling into the state from the United States as well as another country is required to self-quarantine. So just to end with uh, that, these are some of the, you know, the things that we're seeing out there. Keep your social distance. At least we're trying to be creative and play a little bit with our what's in our DNA about an outdoor recreation destination to show how we uh, model good behavior for all everyone. Um, so currently in Big Sky, we are part of this statewide tourism ecosystem. We are part of the Yellowstone Country Tourism Region, which in 2019 collected $13 million in hotel bed tax. Um, Big Sky specifically, uh, this is kind of our uh, bed tax collections. As we can see, Big Sky Resorts Winter is the leader in that at $3.2 million in 2019 collected. Uh, that put us in second behind Billings as the largest bed tax collector in the state of Montana as a little community of less than 3,000 people. It's pretty significant. Um, and for 2020, looking at first quarter, which you don't see on here, but you can see reflected in our local resort tax mechanism, look to your top left, the little black line, um, that's January and February. We were charting a course that had March continued and we followed a normal through the remainder of the year to potentially be the largest bed tax collector in the state of Montana. So some pretty significant happenings from all of that. And um, in Big Sky locally, we're at about 7% in occupancy at the moment. A good part of that are construction workers who are continuing to work in that deemed essential industry throughout this last month. Um, in addition, hearing reports from both Bozeman, or Brian Springer and Scott Humphrey on Bozeman International Airport, uh, May was down 95% year over year. So seeing a lot of that air, air traffic um, come to a halt and international travel, as an, as an example, is completely non-existent at the moment. So with that, I wanted to open up the floor to Superintendent Shelley to speak specifically to Yellowstone. We're going to have some announcements, hopefully over the coming week. Um, and he'll just give a recap here and his thoughts on moving forward. And then after that, we'll allow Taylor to speak specifically about locally here in Big Sky with some announcements that came out from the resort this morning. So with that, Cam, I'd love to turn the mic over to you to address the audience. And thank you so much for being here with us today. Yeah, thanks, Candice. It, uh, you know, <clears throat> this has been a very interesting six weeks for, for everyone. And just to kind of revisit you know where we've been and kind of where we are and i'll talk a little bit about what's what we're planning here in the next couple of weeks you know we saw really an unprecedented level of consensus uh from the states and counties back in you know around march 20th or so uh, with concerns about uh visitation uh coming into the gateway communities and potentially uh overtaxing health capacity taking groceries and supplies out of the stores that were intended for residents. And, you know, normally we're not having <clears throat> conversations about, uh, or, you know, positive conversations about closing parks and positive from the standpoint that, you yeah, know, it's, it's controversial anytime we shut down Yellowstone, usually it's for government shutdowns and lapses of appropriations. And in this case, you know, everybody felt that it was in the best interest of the communities, counties and states. And we've remained in that posture for the last six weeks. Uh, I've talked to probably, I've done three very major phone calls with uh, civic leaders and business leaders from Montana Gateways, from Wyoming, a lot of our commercial use author operators that come in and work in the parks and probably uh, had the ability to talk to around 600 people in the last 10 days or so. And what I've seen is, you know, if you look at uh, mid mid March when we started having conversations about closing, it was really hard to find a dissenting opinion on whether closing was the right option or not. Everybody thought that it was. That's really started to shift, especially in the last week. And uh, there's a substantial number of people and a major divergence of opinions that's occurring currently about whether we uh, continue to stay closed or uh, whether we should open. And, and then obviously how we open and when we open, those are the next questions. And so we've worked really hard to maintain as many lines of communications obviously with the governors directly, but also with tourism officials, 
at the state level. I, mean, I just got off a, a, a call with Diane Schober from the Wyoming Tourism Office. I'm doing a session with the tourism folks in, in Jackson and uh, Cody later today. I'll be talking to Governor uh, Gordon this morning, talking to Governor Bullock tomorrow, uh, talking to a lot of the county commissions, and really trying to weave together what opening can look like. I don't have an announcement right now, but we will soon in relationship to what that what that's going to be. I will tell you that generally speaking, and I some of you have heard me talk about this uh, already, <clears throat> is that you know open doesn't mean normal in any in, in any sense of the term. And when we open, it's going to be uh, different than it is normally. I do think that we will see a substantial number of visitors uh, coming to the park. We're balancing right now what has been over the last six weeks fairly consistent state-to-state -state guidance on out-of-state travel restrictions. We're the same in Wyoming as Montana, as Idaho, and now those are starting to diverge. Wyoming's uh, out-of-state travel restrictions expire tomorrow. As you mentioned, Candace, the Montana uh, restrictions are going to remain in place. And that's problematic for for a couple of reasons. I mean, it's it's a, it's not problematic from the standpoint of the governor's. I think done a very good job with this and containing this and working with every entity that he has to and his staff has to in the, in the state. Um, but the the realities are from the standpoint of uh, the gates in Mon the gates that are in Montana. So there's five entrances to Yellowstone. Three are in Montana. Three two are in Wyoming. Uh, but very little. Uh, a very little part of the Wyoming land base of the Yellowstone land base is actually in Montana. And so even though people enter uh, through Montana in three locations, West Yellowstone, Gardner and Cook City, they're only in Montana for a couple miles before they're in Wyoming. Ninety six percent of this park is in Wyoming. And so what we're what we're working through is a state with Wyoming, like Wyoming that's got uh, ninety six percent of the of the park is lifting their out of state restrictions. Uh, and then uh, Montana, which is choosing to, uh, I think for good reason, keep some of those restrictions in place and, and how do we balance that out? And you've also got very different uh, COVID scenarios in the counties. The Park County, Wyoming only had one case uh, that that person's recovered versus Gallatin County, Montana, uh, they, they have a substantial uh, number of, of, of more cases of COVID. And so trying to reconcile uh, the health officer opinions, the governor's opinions, and figure out what that timing looks like is what we're focused on right now. And I think we're gonna have a plan here uh, very soon on that. When we open, uh, the park will, will open in, in kind of a, a phased approach. And that, that, that approach will, will be, you know, if you picture swinging the gates, what could you expect? Um, the, the things that we've got kind of outlined in, in what we're calling kind of a phase one is, Road access, obviously the roads will be open, uh, public restrooms, self-serve gas stations, trails and boardwalks, uh, at least one of our three clinics. And I can talk a little bit more about that. They're having some difficulties recruiting ER doctors and nurses that normally come in. And then, you know, we're going kind of on a case by case for the many businesses that operate in the park, like wildlife tours and outfitters and things like that for how how we can work with them and, and approve plans and, and see if we can get them back on their feet sooner than later. But it'd be really kind of limited, no overnight accommodations, day use only initially. And then we've got a whole list of facilities like our stores, visitor centers, you know, you know, everything from boating and fishing, the marinas and things like that, uh, that would come online slowly after that. And they would be, you know, when when it's safe to do so. For instance, marinas Yellowstone Lake is still under ice right now. It doesn't normally open anyway until June. So some things uh, are going to just open on kind of normal schedules. The concessioner here, Zantera, has got uh, you know a terrific plan that we were we worked with them on to open up visitor cabins only, no major hotels initially. And those some of those cabins would open up. Uh, you know they might open up some of the old faithful cabins and you know around Memorial Day or something. I'm just throwing that out there. Uh, I don't know if that's going to happen. Uh, and then another set of cabins in early June. So, you know, we've got a, an ability to start conservatively, uh, accelerate if things are looking good, and then be able to contract if, if they're not. We're not gonna offer, you know, all the hotels aren't gonna be open in the park right away. 
We're not gonna have sit down, uh, full service dining right away. Uh, we're we're gonna have a lot of conversations with the tour bus operators for the major tours like cars and things like that about you know what what are their mitigation plans and likely uh, there probably won't be a major bus tours coming into the park and that kind of limited opening but we're going to talk to them about what they're thinking and then we want them to correspond also with the health officers who have concerns with some of those bigger groups and things like that and how we can figure figure a way through that so that's kind of what that'll look like um, I we we've only you know we normally hire about 4,000 seasonal employees in Yellowstone every summer between the Park Service and our, our concession partners. We're only bringing in about a thousand. It's still a lot, but that number was basically uh, agreed upon uh, to correspond to the number of employees that we could put in individual housing units, and we didn't want to pack the dorms and have shared bathrooms and things like that, and then have a major employee outbreak. So we want to be really cautious with the workforce. And as I said, the good news is that we can, um, you know, isolate an employee that might have COVID symptoms. The bad news is that configuration severely restrains the number of people that we can bring in, which then correlates to how many facilities that we can we can operate. So we're going to go into that light mode for probably, you know, four weeks or so. I would say, uh, you know, at some point, in June, we'll start having a conversation about do we want to, is it, you know, what's happening around us? Do we want to try to open up more facilities like hotels and sit down dining? Uh, you know, what what's the county's comfort level with that, the states, uh, all of those kind of things. And so, you know, one of the things that we have the ability to do, I think, very, very well is to control and meter uh, access in our inside of our public facility so you know we can do a better job of controlling social distancing and allowing only a certain number of people into a particular facility what we don't necessarily have control over is m massive groups of people at old faithful or in at the grand canyon of the yellowstone or places like that so we're you know we're working to partner with the public to protect each other and there's got to be a responsibility that the public takes uh, to adhere to social distancing and, and the health guidance that's in place. Uh, the Park Service is not going to have the staff uh, uh, to, you know, sit in the middle of crowds at Old Faithful and spread people out and that kind of thing. Plus, that puts our employees at risk. So we'll hope that when we swing the gates, the visiting public is responsible and that uh, we proceed over the next month or so and get to a point where things are looking good and we can continue to ramp up uh, the opening of facilities. If we can't, we'll stay where we are or we can pull back if we need to. As I understand from Zantara, <clears throat> their bookings further out in the summer are still really strong. Uh, obviously, they're, it's challenging any of you that are dealing with reservations and things like that, uh, you know, trying to put a horizon date on when a facility is going to be open when you've got so much in, in flux is, is difficult. But I think if we can get to a point uh, where things don't blow up around us, uh, we can maintain, we can keep our staff safe. Uh, the fastest thing that could shut the park down again would be if we had some massive outbreak of, of uh, COVID with our employee or workforces, whether, whether that be the park service, first responders or, you know, uh, concession, concession employees. And so we've got a plan to Reclose facilities if that becomes necessary. You know, if worst case scenario happened, we 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 might re uh, consider reclosing the park. We, we hope that doesn't happen, but we need to plan for that. And uh, you know, we'll see how it goes. So I'll stop there, Candice, and happy to answer any questions. Or if Taylor wants to go and you're planning on doing a Q and A, that's great too. Either way. Yes, I think we thought we would allow then Taylor to speak about the resort and Big Sky, and then open it up for those questions if you don't mind uh, following Perfect. that. Perfect. With that, Taylor, you want to take the floor? Yeah. Hi, Candace. Hi, Cam. Hi, everyone. Uh, hope you're doing okay. I. Uh, it, it's been uh, it's been uh, humbling to see all the hard work that's going on in our community, uh, all the patience that has been exhibited, all the businesses that have bucked up and have endured. Uh, uh, it's. Uh, there are a lot of good things that have have come out of this mess but boy is it a mess right uh, 
our community, uh, we're leaders, right? Uh, every business uh, person in this community, every person in this community, we led the way on, on the COVID shutdown in, in North America. Not by much, uh, every mountain town did exactly the same thing we did for exactly the same reason. Um, and our community got lucky. Uh, maybe it was because of our actions, maybe it was because of luck. As we know, there were a lot of outbreaks in ski towns around the nation and the world. Uh, we were watching what was going on in Europe uh, before we closed on March the 15th. We were watching what was going on in Colorado and we were making plans for reduction in services and social distancing, but uh, it really wasn't um, until 18 hours before we closed that it became apparent that closing was, was a real option and that's how quickly things shut down. As hard as shutting down was, opening is gonna be harder, right? Opening the park is going to be harder, opening all these businesses, opening this resort, opening the economy of the nation and the world. It's going to be a lot more complicated than we think, and it's going to take a lot longer than we think. And uh, I've, I've talked to some of you before, and I've talked about the importance of, of patience and uh, viable business models and uh, following data and science as we make these decisions, because when we open, we, we need to get it right. We've got to get it right. Uh, and when we open, we want to stay open. Uh, there are a whole lot of, of, of data points that are keeping us as a community primarily closed right now, uh, the 14-day uh, quarantine by the state of Montana, which has been smart so far. Uh, that's one of the things, only having five or eight percent of the normal airlift capacity coming into Bozeman is one of those things. By the way, our typical business model for Big Sky Resort uh, is about 70 percent of our guests in the summertime are coming from out-of-state origins. Um, uh, employees, we heard Cam talk about the complexity of employees, not just recruiting them, not just getting them here, not just uh, housing them, but keeping them safe. Um, keeping our community safe. Those are all just some, I'm just scratching the surface of all these complexities. We've kind of, we've kind of put a box of six key points together uh, and, and I'm gonna briefly talk about those six key points uh, necessary to, to have a successful business operation. First and foremost, we're, we're in business and I'm speaking really for the whole community. Uh, it has to be a viable business model. How are how's our community going to operate at 25% or 50% of of normal visitation successfully? And we've got to figure that out. Uh, economic success, right? Um, number two, near term, our guest origins are going to be different with the travel ban and with the problem with airlines we're going to be much more heavily dependent on drive markets and as we start promoting again and we're not doing any promotions now it's important that we um, we know this and that we promote differently to a different group of people um, number three just like the park uh, all of our businesses in our community are going to have to operate differently with uh, social distancing and uh, testing and uh, contact tracing and uh, uh, just so many ways we're gonna have to operate differently. And I, I know a lot of businesses in this community are working on their operating plans. There's a lot of guidance out there from industry associations, from state and federal governments. Uh, uh, and we, ha we have an operating plan that we have built. Uh, but that leads to number four, which is flexibility because things are changing so rapidly. We didn't know that we were gonna close the resort 18 hours before we closed the resort. Uh, we don't know what's gonna happen with hotspots like uh, Superintendent Shalley was just talking about in Yellowstone Park. What if we, if we have another outbreak in our guest community or in our county or in our employee base? I, what does that mean and how do we pivot to that? So, Flexibility in a, in a thousand different ways is going to be really important. Um, 
Number five, the, 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 the health impact, we hope it's going to be short. Short is uh, 12, 18, 24 months, but the economic impact is not gonna be short term. We are building business models that, that project out a gradual attainment of the levels of business that we had been attaining here in the Big Sky community. Candace, you, you uh, showed the resort tax collections. That demonstrates that our community had been at record-breaking pace for about five consecutive years. I'm sure glad that we had reset, we as a community had reset our baseline of visitation, which is about double what it was five years ago. Uh, uh, I'm glad that we're building from a baseline that was so much bigger um, because it's going to fall for the summer. It's certainly going to fall for the winter and it might fall for a couple of years, but um, I'm glad we started with a high visitation uh, from which we can rebuild. And then number six, it's, it's kind of where I started. Our, we are leaders. Everybody on this phone is a leader. Our community is a leader. Um, we've got to lead with optimism. Uh, we've got to lead with intelligent uh, decision making. We've got to lead with viable business options. We've got to get open for business. We've got to stay open for business. And we've got to take care of one another. And those six guiding concepts are, are how we're making decisions. Um, uh, you know, none of us as leaders like to say we don't know. Uh, that's, that's not a good answer to a lot of questions. But I can tell you, I don't know is the most common smart answer that we've all been hearing lately. We don't know where this thing is going. So we're taking it measured do doses and we're going to open Big Sky much like um, Superintendent Shali is opening Yellowstone. We're going to open it in phases. We just announced today that um, the first phase is very limited. The golf course is opening on uh, May the 20. Second, the Whitewater Inn Motel down in the canyon is opening on that same day. Um, we uh, are going to open mountain biking and scenic lifts up in the mountain village about a month later on June the 26th in front of, of the 4th of July. Uh, that's pretty close to the typical opening date for, for biking because of snow loads that are I was on the mountain village yesterday afternoon, three or four feet in, in the village. I look at the webcams, right? Um, so, so phase one, one is pretty simple. We'll have the exchange open, the bathrooms. We'll have great pizza. We'll, we have plenty of room for social distancing in the exchange. And, and uh, then phase two will be the mountain village hotels and conferences and uh, seated dining and we have plans for all of those things but we do not have a specific opening date for that so uh, th then i'll move to winter and then um I'll, I'll open for for you to take q a candace but winter uh same thing we expect uh, to be open for winter we expect it to be a uh, a different type of winter than we've seen before uh, we expect our visitation to be much less than in the typical winter, but uh, we're fully planning on opening for winter. As everybody knows, we delayed the capital construction of the Swift Current Lift, which we'd already purchased, by the way. It's sitting in a yard in Europe now, and it's going to be brought over to the U.S. Uh, either later this summer or this winter, and we plan on installing that lift next summer. Um, so we're still in the ski business. We're still in the business of driving visitation in our community, but uh, it's different. Okay, thank you so much, gentlemen. With that, um, Paige is going to take over and take questions via the chat mechanism. So hopefully she's already got some teed up and ready for us. Paige, you wanna take over? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and just to reiterate, if anybody wants to ask a question, there is a question box in your control panel where you can just type it and I receive all of those. 
Um, so the first question, Cam, is uh, about the boardwalks and how you guys are going to be preparing for people gathering on boardwalks and if you need assistance with social distancing and helping with um, volunteer work to make sure that nobody's gathering in crowds. Yeah, so that's a great question and we're having that conversation regularly. There are <clears throat> there are places where we think we can we can manage uh, a lot of the traffic in the parking lots and the boardwalks effectively there are places where that's going to be more challenging and so we've done it we're doing an analysis of you know some in some places you have a parking lot and a boardwalk that loops around and ends at another parking lot and so you know one of the things that makes sense and one of the biggest recommendations has been to create one-way directional traffic on the boardwalk so you don't have people passing the problem with that in some of those places is people park one place and if you put them on a one-way boardwalk that doesn't end at the same place they end up somewhere that's not near their car so we're looking at you know where where do some of those types of um, measures where can we how can we do that better what's the signage need to be uh, we want to be cognizant also that you know if we if we try to meter visitor traffic onto boardwalks, that how do we manage an enormous queue line that develops in the parking lots waiting to get on the boardwalk? And, you know, I think if you take a place like the Grand Canyon or the Yellowstone, if for those of you that have, have been there, you have to, you're on the main road and then there's a, a turnoff to say get to North Rim Drive. You actually have to turn off the main road and drive in. There's a very good control point there where we can say we're only going to allow 50% of the cars into the North Rim Drive at any given time, and we can do a, a you know one out one in type of, of thing pretty easily in some of those areas. And it, I always use the boardwalk at, at Old Faithful. You know we normally have 11,000 people per day there. It's 360 degree a, a access, um, and there is not a lot of fantastic options there except for uh, continuing to reinforce that the public needs to take some responsibility for social distancing. There's a lot of opinion about whether the Park Service has the primary responsibility to keep people six feet away from each other or whether the public has the responsibility to keep uh, the proper distance and adhere to health guidance. It's a partnership. We're going to do the best that we can. I think if there's people that want to volunteer you know we're all we, we we rely so heavily on volunteers they're essential to our operation uh you know we'll look for where those roles can be filled but i want and i'm going to make this very clear in the press the park service is not going to be able to uh, control major crowding uh in many of these locations the in the size of this park i mean remember this park is bigger than rhode island and delaware put together uh the number of people that come here and i've got people saying cap the number of visitors that can come into the park. So I want people to tell me how I do that exactly. So we have 4 million people come here a year. What's the number? Is it two? Uh, 50,000 people per day, should it be 20? How many people get to come in, which entrance? When do I say you can't come in? Um, I tell people, you know, okay, we get to 20,000 people in the park at, and 60% of those are in the Old Faithful Corridor. Does that mean you can't come in at, at Cody or East Entrance or, or Cook City? So it's challenging, and also people need to understand that even if we said no more than no more than twenty thousand people per day or whatever can come in, you're still going to have people that concentrate in certain areas in the park. So, you know, if people are, I, I fully expect uh, if we open for Memorial Day weekend, that the 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 country is going to be littered with pictures of people around Old Faithful and other places that are in mass and probably not adhering. We're going to do the best that we can. Uh, but I don't know that anyone uh, is going to be able to control some of the areas uh, that we have in the park. And we're going to we're going to keep we'll keep working on it though and do the best that we can. So hopefully that answers that question somewhat. Yeah, thanks, Cam. Um, Taylor, there's a question that came in about any additional safety precautions that you can talk about that the Big Sky Resort is going to be taking as it reopens in phases. Right. Uh, that's it's a really good question. Right. Uh, social distancing uh, will be a guideline 
Uh, capacity limitations, it's a lot easier for a, a private business to, to limit visitation than it is for Yellowstone Park, for instance. Uh, we will control the number of, of, of guests in our facilities. For instance, the golf course, there's only going to be one golfer per cart. Uh, it's going to be social distancing. We're going to uh, do our best to, to have touchless financial transactions. Uh, for instance, the, the, the food and beverage out of the bunker at the golf course, it, we're not even opening it the first week to gauge how things go. And then the second week, we do plan on opening it for, for window service and takeout only. Um, we do expect our employees to be wearing masks. We may uh, require all of our guests to be wearing masks. Again, we're gonna be flexible and observant to what the guidelines that are coming from the health care industry are at that time, but that's very likely. Uh, uh, sneeze screens at, at close points of contact. We are um, uh, cleaning and sanitizing. Uh, that's just a, an example of some of the things that we're thinking about. Okay, great. <clears throat> um, for Cam, there is a question here regarding if you can talk about any of the possibilities of private bus tours that are coming from Big Sky that might be able to operate in West Yellowstone. Um, if you know a timeline or if you can discuss a little bit more of the details. Yeah, so that's a great question. And I, um, so as I said earlier, we have 200 to 250 commercial operators that operate in the park each year. And that ranges from backcountry outfitters to, you know, small tour, uh, wildlife viewing, fly fishing guides, you name it. Uh, a lot of those can proceed. And we're, we have a, a template that we're asking each one of our operators to fill out that kind of explains what they're thinking about doing to mitigate COVID exposure to their drivers or tour guides, their, obviously their guests and clients. And I think on the smaller scale tours, that's, that's gonna be pretty easy for us to work through. I think that the larger the tours get to, and especially when you start talking about uh, the bigger bus tours, that that's where some of the complexities um, are are going to arise. And like I said, we'll, we're we're going to work closely with the industry. Uh, and this is not just the Yellowstone issue, right? I mean, this is a Grand Canyon or Yosemite or you know Grand Teton, all the major parks that uh, get a lot of tourism through major commercial bus tours is you know what are the first and foremost the thoughts of the health officers uh in and around these jurisdictions uh and what are their 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 professional opinions on uh the the risk of transmission of having tour buses come in at an early stage of opening uh so i think we're going to get there but it's not going to be swing the gate and the tour buses come in and the industry is not doesn't like that. I get it. I think it, I encourage the industry, and I, and I believe we're going to have a call with a, a lot of the industry CEOs here soon mm -hmm. for us to really start educating people on what that industry is doing uh, to uh, satisfy some of the state and local health restrictions that are in place, and then talk about when is the timing right for us to have a conversation about when they restart. And for me, to answer the question more directly, it's when the states start to lift the restrictions on large gatherings. I think that's a good point in time to consider tour buses coming back and resuming operations in the park. If a, if a state uh, or CDC health guidance says, you know, you shouldn't be in crowds of a certain size, you know, clearly there's more than 10 people on most buses. You know, if we get to a point where a lot of those things are lifting and they're saying now you can be in groups of 100 safely with mitigation, uh, then I think that's an appropriate time to have that conversation. But I, I recognize the value of the large bus tours economically and otherwise, but understand uh, that the health officers in these surrounding counties, uh, many of which we're relying on, as are the governors and others, uh, to help keep us safe, do not necessarily agree with uh, swinging the gates and allowing the bus tours to resume. So 
uh, that, that's a, that conversation is going to need to occur, and we're going to try to provide as much clarity as we can as we move forward. Thank you. Um, Taylor, there is a question asked if there is a PDF or some kind of document that outlines um, the Big Sky Resort's plan to reopen, uh, just so that it can be easily shareable around the community and any visitors that are interested in traveling here. There is a press release that was uh, dropped this morning that a uh, list phase one, but uh, the uh, uh, beyond phase one, there's nothing published yet. And the reason we haven't published is because we don't know. If you go back to those six points, flexibility uh, is, is one of them, and we don't have enough information, uh, i.e., on the 14-day quarantine or, or the uh, airline transportation restart, we don't have enough information to put hard data behind the opening date specifics of phase two. But uh, you can bet that, listen, we're in a business that's not based on being closed. We're, we're all in a business model that's based on being open and we want to open as fast as we can uh, safely and viably. And, and we'll, communicate that with the community as soon as we can. Um, perfect. Cam, do you know if there's a point that the park has talked about opening overnight backpacking use? Yeah, so my intention is to open the backcountry on normal schedule this year. And so, you know, as you know, a lot of the Yellowstone backcountry is under snow well into June. <clears throat> I feel very confident that um, we can generally adhere to a normal backcountry use, including backcountry camping schedule. And since I'm going to be in the backcountry, I have a, a personal interest of getting the getting the backcountry open. Great. Um, this one's kind of for Candace and for Cam. Um, do you guys have any? Any uh, input to say about Wyoming dropping their 14-day quarantine effect tomorrow um, and how that will impact Montana since we are still at that 14-day quarantine? Uh, go ahead, Candice. I've got plenty of perspectives. Oh, oh great. Yeah, hot potato. Um, I, actually, I don't wish to comment on that. Uh, that's the governor of Wyoming's decision. And I, I mean, how it will impact us. They'll see visitors. I think we can use it as an experiment to watch what happens uh, when that 14-day quarantine is lifted. So we'll obviously be watching very closely the gateway communities on the Wyoming side with the, the lifting of this quarantine and, and uh, kind of a guinea pig, I guess. They're going to go first. So what I would add to that is, you know, the governors are, are doing a great job and they're in tough positions. And, and anybody that doesn't understand how many divergent opinions there are on economics, politics, um, health, the health sides of this issue, uh, you know, it's, it's there's not, to, to Taylor's great point, I mean, uh, we've got some data. Sometimes the data seems reliable, but then it turns out not to be. It's very hard to predict the future without reliable historic data. Um, I think that, Everybody is working out of the abundance of caution, but they also understand that, you know, we're being economically devastated here. And, um, you know, what I'm about to say, I'm not downplaying the, the virus because I know how serious it is, uh, but we're going to have to turn the corner at some point. I mean, I read something the other day, uh, you know, 300 and something uh, employees in a meat processing facility uh, tested positive for COVID. And so if you're like, oh, well, yeah, that's really bad. Yeah, it is. Uh, what's worse about that particular case is that every single one of them did not have symptoms. And when you look at the antibody testing, especially that's going on in some of the states and New York's got a huge sample size, you know, like 12 to 14% of 15,000 people tested for antibodies had had COVID. And so you start thinking about some of that. How do you defend against very large percentages uh, of the population that have it and don't even know it. And at what point does the economic stressors of the situation start to outweigh the fear of the virus? And, and we may not quite be there, but I'm telling you, we will be there soon. And I think everybody psychologically is going to have to get their head around the fact that, 
you know, we are going to have to live with COVID for a long time. There's mitigation that we can we can put into place that's proven to to work if we follow it. You know, Montana set aside 1,650 beds for COVID. They're using five beds right now. Um, so a lot of the projections that have been made, you know, some have under projected, some have over projected. Uh, but the governors are really trying to do the best job that they can, listening to their health experts, understanding. I mean, they understand uh, as well as anybody or better what the economic impacts are to their states. They want to thread that needle. What we don't want to do is go too fast. And everybody has said to me that we would rather sacrifice, you know, an April or even a May, even if it means that we can have a strong July and August. And if we do the wrong things in May, uh, that could that could severely affect how we're operating in August if we if we do it poorly. So, you know, it's not a one size fits all. And I think even here for the park, because we sit in three states, you know, we're going to have to come up with some creative ways of figuring out how we open. And that may not be all five entrances at once. It might be, you know, uh, we look at some entrances open some stay closed for an extra week or two or whatever the case is but we're going to do our best to kind of reconcile that and balance the health concerns with the economic impacts okay great as of right now it doesn't look like there's any more questions in the queue um, i'm slowly getting back to ones who have already answered the same question but or asked the same question so candace if you want to continue Sure. Gentlemen, before we move forward with some of the tourism vital signs that are coming in from the different bodies conducting research on a weekly basis, is there any last comment you'd like to make with the audience? Go ahead, Taylor. I defer to you. You know, I, I'm going to kind of play on what uh, Cam was just talking about in a conversation that Candace and I and others were having a, just a couple of days ago about opening decisions, right? Um, everybody on this call knows the importance of, of, of getting information that we can use to make business decisions. That question that came to me earlier in the session, what are the dates? Can Big Sky publish its, uh, its phase two, its phase three plan? Everybody's trying to figure out how they're gonna open their businesses and when, because we know that we're in this planning phase for hiring employees and training and, and investing capital and upstart. And at some point, if we're not open, we as a community I'm talking about, or we as a state, if, if we're not open for summer by some date, a lot of us will not open. Uh, and I, I believe that Fundamentally, if, if, if our community and if Yellowstone and our tourism region isn't fundamentally open by late June, that we're going to be at risk for losing the entirety of the summer. And uh, we are all asking the same question that you asked me of our political leaders to try to, as best they can, realistically, to start assigning some dates from which all of, of us as business people can start making decisions to either get open or uh, to dial back our, our spending to save that resource so we can have a successful opening uh, later. Yeah, and I would just say, <clears throat> we do have a plan that is gonna be released here shortly. Uh, it's a very difficult plan to write based on everything that Taylor just talked about. There are so many variables and and different things that impact what we do. And someone could look at it and go, well, it doesn't, you know, it gives us some information, but maybe not enough information. And and so we've got a, a, a plan that I think gives some good detail, but it's got to be flexible and, and it can be altered at any given time, depending on what's happening. These gateway communities and including Big Sky, I think need to uh, kind of, off of what I was just talking about, understand what a, a you know, the, the numbers are going to go up. If you open this park, uh, the numbers in the gateways are likely going to go up. Now, if you have one case in Cody, Wyoming, or in Park County, Wyoming, uh, which is what they have, then I think that person's recovered. 
and suddenly we have 20 cases, you know, you could say, well, that's 20 times worse, but 20, 20 cases uh, of COVID, uh, many of which may not even know they have it or have light symptoms. They're not, most of them aren't gonna be hospitalized. Very little chance that they're gonna die. Uh, you know, is that, is that enough of a trigger to say, wow, it's, it's 20 instead of one, so we're gonna, let's reshut the park or let's reshut Cody or whatever the case is. You know, seven or eight cases in Park County, Montana is 50 cases, uh, you know, going to shock the conscience because these counties have done a good job of keeping those numbers low. I think people need to psychologically get their head around the fact that, you know, I don't know what that number is. It's too many, uh, but the numbers are going to go up and how we respond to that, I think, is going to be uh, very important um, moving forward. But I, I will tell you in closing that there like I said, no shortage of opinions on what we should be doing, but it's because people care. Lots of great ideas. Uh, I think we've done a good job of communicating on uh, more fronts than I can count and trying to find common denominators and a, a good clear direction that's flexible for the future is, is what we're focused on. So thanks for having having me on and it's always it's always good to be able to talk to everybody. But I think Following to your up point, on what you were just saying, Cal, if I can add one thing, testing and contact tracing. So when that scenario does happen where we do have outbreaks, where we certainly will have some COVID coming, the governor had spent last week announcing to the state of Montana that he has a lot more tests available now, that every symptomatic person can be tested. And then subsequently, once we have excellent contact tracing going on, we as a, a micro society will be able to limit the spread of, of that particular disease and that particular incident. And that might be one of the tools we use to stay open uh, while we're operating in a, in a COVID environment. Well, I want to thank you both. Um, I think something that is a positive as well that's come out of this is the collaboration um, with our partners is uh, the best it's been, I think, ever. And so we appreciate and thank you for the opportunity to be a part of that collaboration and discussion. Um, and before we turn kind of with these tourism vital signs that we've got teed up here to the consumer side of what's going on right now and really take a chance for people to understand that before we talk about what Visit Big Sky is positioning itself to do, I do wanna just reiterate that um, the US Travel Association in coordination with medical professionals and across the tourism spectrum has put together guidelines for industries by segment for reopening, uh, best practices. In addition, the uh, American Hotel and Lodging Association has done that, the National Restaurant Association has done that. So uh, we would just wanna make sure that all of our small businesses recognize what types of resources are being put out there for them to deal with the new normal operating uh, environment, Taylor, that you alluded to in one of your six key points. Um, in addition, the Gallatin County, uh, City County Public Health Department will be hosting tomorrow, Friday, May 8th at 11 a.m. a community briefing as well to speak to businesses about how they've seen the reopening going, answer some questions. So be sure to check out their website for information on how you can check into that should you wanna uh, participate in that call. Um, here operationally, just as, as a last part before we skip into some slides, is uh, the Big Sky Chamber and Visit Big Sky are open and operating. However, the visitor center at this time is closed and we'll be, just like Taylor and Cam said, kind of watching for different phases uh, into phase two and phase three before we open to visitors coming into the visitor center. Um, we are a very small staff and we're very similar to a lot of our small businesses and so that new normal operations what that requires of us to ensure safety for our workers as well as the traveling public um, is not something that we can take on at the moment. So with that, again, thank you both. Kim, really appreciate it. Taylor, thank you so very much. Um, and the visitbigsky.com website will have uh, a link to that update from Big Sky Resort as well for anyone who asked that question about the timeline and where to find more information. So with that said, I'd love for us to take advantage of some research that's currently being done by the U.S. Travel Association with destination analysts out of San Francisco to show a little bit about what that traveling public is thinking. So this, this was the latest um, survey that's been done. As you see across the top of this graphic, it started back on March the 13th, and it's been done subsequently every week 
um, gauging tourism sentiment on various questions. The light gray, the white and light gray are older, moving into the blues of the most recent. And so the biggest thing out of this slide is the positive trending of people who agreed and strongly agreed that they would not look to travel until the crisis had resolved itself. Um, so Cam, I think speaking to your psychological mindset of the public and in accepting that um, living and having to function within an environment where the COVID virus exists is starting to be accepted by some of the public. So it's a positive trend. Um, that, that leads to um, some of this. The readiness to fly, however, on commercial airlines, um, there is still a significant segment of the traveling public that is very concerned and uncomfortable about getting on an airplane. And I think our, our um, airline partners uh, are dealing with the economic impact of this crisis. But in addition, those consumers, even if they were available to travel, aren't ready to go on the plane and travel. So that speaks much to another point that Taylor brought up of the, the change in who was our uh, visitor or potential visitor in the past is becoming much closer to home uh, drive market, including the entire state of Montana and our adjacent states um, once that 14 day self quarantine would be lifted. And so um, how many people are enjoying the comfort of their own home community now that we can go out and move about the cabin? Uh, again, showing a positive upward trend that they're more and more comfortable in going out into their own marketplace. Um, I, I think our situation here in Montana is pretty unique along with a handful, maybe only of other states where within our borders at only roughly 465 cases in the entire state of Montana and in Gallatin County having been the largest uh, number at a, roughly I think 146 last I checked, um, and there haven't been any new cases in at least the last week. Um, our comfort level in locally and within our own community moving around is very much on par, if not better, more optimistic than this national representation. Um, how many people wouldn't travel without a, a vaccine? Again, this is, I think, showing the adjustment of a mindset of the new normal is going to include living and functioning in our daily lives with the existence of the virus for what Taylor had said, short term, 12, 18, 24 months and beyond. This perceived safety of travel activities very much plays into what we as Montana as a travel destination offer that's part of our DNA. If you look to the bottom of this graphic, um, taking a road trip, visiting friends and relatives, um, staying in a hotel, but the non-team outdoor recreation activities at the very bottom only shows roughly 20% of people who are who feel somewhat unsafe and very unsafe. Um, I think for anyone on the call who has been out recreating uh, over the last three weeks has seen um, Montanans use of our natural beauty and, and that sentiment exactly. This last slide is what I believe, um, uh, well, sorry, not last slide, I have a couple more, uh, shows that optimistic outlook that we have, that people are anxious to get back to being able to travel. They definitely miss that. This slide speaks specifically to the spirit of travel that National Travel and Tourism Week is, is celebrating this week. 70% um, of people are looking forward to travel until the point where they, they, they can travel again. I just wanted to show this once again that about flights, we are going to be really looking at a drive market, I think, in the near term for this summer season and into the fall. And that, that plays very well for us here in Montana. Showing plate replacing the air travel with road trips. And we'll have all of these slides available for everyone after the call. We'll make sure they're on the Visit Big Sky website. So for us, what does that mean? The slide to your left is our region, showing that greater Yellowstone region, uh, Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, and America's first national park, as well as Big Sky specifically. Um, and so we'll be focused here as we begin to open up and we're just seeing our restaurants take advantage of that opportunity as of May 4th um, to get the word out of what is open so that we can try to, to facilitate some commerce from those of us living here as well as those from this region. The upper right shows you the slide of the 56 counties in Montana, um, broken up by tourism region. 
because I do want to emphasize that we are working very closely with the state tourism office, as well as our Yellowstone Country Tourism Region and six other CDBs, those convention and visitor bureaus that fall within Yellowstone Country, as well as across tourism region. So Glacier Country just um, offered a co-op opportunity with everyone throughout the state where we're gonna be pushing each other's content out and about because people are, are gonna be looking to take most likely shorter trips, day trips, but also um, you know, driving the scenic tours that Montana's three brand pillars are the amazing natural beauty we have to offer, our scenic drives and our charming small communities. So all of that plays into the environment that we now find ourselves in. Lastly, that, that um, picture on the bottom right was the state tourism office um, area for last summer, summer of 2019. Um, I just wanted everyone to see a lot of that national coverage was via television. Um, they have pulled back for the coming summer season a lot of that national press and our focus on those regional heavy ups, as well as the drive market and in state of Montana, which is kind of a diversion of what's been done in the past on the state level. Uh, but we do recognize the new kind of the new reality that we're living in and we're trying to be flexible for Taylor. Um, and adjust accordingly. Um, those those uh, dots reflect some of our direct flight markets. We had over the last probably six months in working with Bozeman International Airport made announcements of going up to 20 direct flights into the airport, the single largest um, airport in the state of Montana, which for the 10th year in a row broke passenger records. Um, that obviously, the like we said, May was down 95% year over year. And June, it's too early to tell. A lot of the airlines have yet to put out their schedules for June, um, but the anticipation is at least a minimal 50% uh, decrease year over year. Again, it's that whole waiting to see um, as phase one continues, we move into phase two, what airlines then do uh, and, and what um, traveling uh, people from the United States want to do and getting on an airplane. Oops, I didn't want to go all the way there already. Um, so with that, you know, Visit Big Sky has positioned the Big Sky destination um, in summer as a gateway community to Yellowstone. We have unparalleled outdoor recreation opportunities from our 50 plus hikes that fall within our geographic footprint to our whitewater rafting, our fly fishing offerings, and numerous other outdoor activities for summer, including what um, Taylor just mentioned is gonna to begin to reopen at Big Sky Resort very soon. Um, beyond that, as a gateway community, when you look at those other um, small rural communities, we offer accommodations as well as dining options that are unsurpassed in any of those other gateways. So we feel that is definitely a competitive advantage of ours as people look to either stay in and around the park. So with that, we are currently, we do have a little bit of advertising still out in the market. We had started a, a campaign that was very um, customer driven back in, uh, sorry, what month are we in? In March, so it's been running for two months, March and April. And that was really a cost per click uh, campaign that was being driven by people searching for lodging in and around Yellowstone, including many of those gateway communities we talked about, as well as our drive flight markets across the nation. So for the last two months, we have been when people were actually actively searching to be served information on our destination, still providing that to them. Our budgets that we had set on that actually um, did not fully reach all of that demand. So we've recently just doubled that budget to be able to serve that content up to those people. Uh, in addition, we um, had scheduled a campaign to start May 1st, working with, so that, that first campaign was with Metric out of Bozeman, our partners on that campaign. And then a second campaign with Orange 142 out of Austin, Texas was teed up to begin May 1st. That was going to retro fronts the entire Big Sky Resort Area District and be able to communicate and retarget to everyone who came here over the winter 1920 season. And we still have that lined up. However, we have not pulled the trigger on that campaign because as of right now, we really, a lot of those out of state uh, guests, is, it's not a good communication that we wanna put out there. I do wanna be very clear that in no way, shape or form has Visit Big Sky put out to the collective, come, come here and come here now. Uh, we very much have been on the inspiration side of things, inspiring people, we, we get to live the dream here. That's that's the line that comes off of everyone's mouths, be it the gentleman who opens the door for you at the Huntley Hotel, or as you walk around Town Center, or over at Bucks T4, 
And so we want people to come live the dream, but we just want them to keep the dream alive right now and plan today for travel tomorrow. So that has very much been our positioning on um, keeping communications with guests uh, and potential guests who will come to visit Big Sky in the future. So all of these things really are positioning Montana as a whole, as well as Big Sky, to be a highly sought after destination when the time does come that we can welcome guests back. Um, we are working regionally with a, a group of tourism professionals having a call on Wednesdays at 11 o'clock following a 10 o'clock economic development regional call. Um, and so I would invite anyone that's interested in participating in that and having these types of conversations on a weekly basis of where things are uh, in this timeline progression through phase one into phase two and beyond, please reach out to me directly at Candice at visitbigskymt.com. I'm happy to put you on that list to join us for those calls. It's in partnership with Anna Rosenberry and Britt Fontenot, who both are with the city of Bozeman, but again, encompasses all of Madison, Gallatin and Park County uh, tourism stakeholders talking about our current situation, uh, including concessionaires in the park too. So we feel we're we're definitely getting insights from the park. Um, with that, I, I would love to recognize the Visit Big Sky Board of Directors, as well as Team Big Sky, the staff here. So our current operating officers are Tim Drain is our president of our board with Dan Martin of Car, so, and Tim is with Natural Retreats. Dan Martin with Car Stage is our vice president and Ryan Kunz, general manager of Low Mountain Ranch is our uh, secretary treasurer. In addition, um, I'm cheating because I don't want to lose every, anybody's name. Um, other board members include Justin Bain with Cross Harbor Capital Partners, Julie Grimm Lisk of Jake's Horses, um, Krista Traxler with Low Mountain Land Company, Josh Treasure with Roxy's, and um, I'm missing somebody. Shoot, who am I missing? Who's my problem? Tim, Dan, Ryan. Oh, Ryan Hamilton. I, I don't know how I could have missed that. So, Ryan Hamilton with Big Sky Town Center was really the founding board chair of Visit Big Sky. And with the end of this fiscal year on June 30th, Ryan will be stepping away from the board with the completion of his term. And I just, I personally wanna thank him for all his assistance, for me professionally and coming on board over the last three years, that institutional knowledge of how Visit Big Sky came about and, and the Big Sky destination has evolved over the last two decades um, and, and really give him um, our gratitude undying gratitude for all of his service to uh, the Big Sky community at large. So with that, I wanna thank all of them. Your staff includes uh, Paige Desitoff, who's our tourism stakeholder manager that's been kind of um, driving us through this meeting here today. Emily Lassard, who runs our visitor center, which hopefully we will have up and operating once again very soon. Uh, Lori Wetzel, my compliance manager, who really helps with the funding. And this is a very um, complicated funding mechanism that supports your Visit Big Sky uh, destination marketing organization with funds from our local resort tax, as well as the state bed tax funds and other private contributions from um, commercial entities. And then last but not least, this, the chamber side of the house, which is um, Peter who's Bosworth, who's working with us temporarily on, on a marketing communications front, as well as Caitlin Cuisenberry, who is out on maternity leave with a newborn baby who was just born about a month ago now, as well as Nicole, um, who is our graphic designer that makes us look beautiful and all of our uh, creative that goes out to our, our potential guests. So with that, I just, I wanna open up if there are any other questions of the materials that have been presented today um, to see if, if anybody has any other questions related to what's going on. Paige, do you wanna open that up? Yep, it's open currently, so I'll give it just a couple seconds and see if any questions roll in. So while you're waiting for that and people have to type, I will share. So in addition to the metric cost per click campaign that's really consumer driven, the teed up one, Orange 142 campaign um, to communicate back to our, our visitors who are here over the past winter season, um, Visit Big Sky also does a lot of um, placements in um, uh, Yellowstone National Park related media and we have uh, garnered significant number of leads from that as well as from visitor guide requests. And so that, that um, list of potential visitors will also be, allow us to serve up messaging to that group specifically that it has a very high likelihood of coming to visit Big Sky in the near future as soon as possible. So there's that. In addition, our website, our Facebook and Instagram pages have been extremely active. 
We are doing our very best to um, cross post with a lot of our partners um, to ensure that we're getting their messaging out here locally. Um, and then again, working with the state and US travel to cascade these, uh, not only nationally, but Brand USA has also been doing a lot in featuring individual destinations out to the international market for when one day that market does come back as well. Any questions, Paige? I'm not seeing anything come through. Okay. Well, I wanna thank everyone for your time here today. Again, I really wanna thank Taylor Middleton and Cameron Shawley for joining us. Um, I think we're very privileged to be able to have these two gentlemen so accessible to us to communicate out what their entities are doing. Um, we here too at Visit Big Sky are, are available and happy to take any questions, comments, concerns uh, individually if anybody wants to reach out as well. So with that, we're gonna conclude today's presentation. We hope next year to be back uh, for our fourth annual Marketing Outlook luncheon in person with all of you. And thank you very much for your time today. Have a great day. There we go.